Hey, what is up everybody? And welcome back to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for getting ahead as a student, but a terrible resource for learning how to spill the tea, sis, because we do not spill tea on this podcast. We don't know that yet. We might still spill tea. Well, let me let me try. Now in like polite culture, you're supposed to pour tea for the other person, right? Or do uh, I pour, pour polite tea? Polite culture. Pol- with pinkies <laughs> out? Or do I pour tea for both of us? I don't... Is there a designated tea? Usually you pour the tea for the other person, yes. Okay, I will pour the tea for you. But let's be honest. We're not that fancy here. Well, look. Oh, I was going to put my pinky out, but I think I would have spilled it. Yeah, no. (laughs) Then you're definitely spilling that tea, son. So for those of you on the audio feed, uh, you're hearing a different voice because Martin is not here today. Nope. I thought we would do a bit of a different episode because my lovely girlfriend, Anna, who also edits this podcast... And has how long have you been editing this podcast for over a uh, year i think a year and a half probably a year and a half yeah um this month so i guess to, to give people some background you've been selling art at comic cons anime conventions sci-fi conventions for over a year at this point mm-hmm. this month you officially made i believe more at those conventions than you make working at cig uh, slightly or at least less, the, actually. Oh, slightly less. Okay, but about the same. About almost the same, yes. So you, so you basically cool. matched your income that you make in your job with your side hustle. Yes. Which is selling art at conventions, which, which is really cool. Yeah, it's the first month that that's ever happened, which is pretty neat. It so is pretty awesome. Yeah. You're rolling You're rolling in it to the point where you bought me dinner like I two did. days ago, which is pretty sweet. I did, sweet. and I <laughs> usually am never able to buy you dinner, but I was able to this time, so I felt pretty neat well a year from now when you're the biggest artist at comic con and you're selling like a hundred thousand dollars worth of posters you can just you know buy me a tesla that's fine uh all right (laughs) um but i thought it would be kind of cool to do an episode about how you got to the point where you're able to make a pretty decent side income selling art at conventions because what was it like two years ago you were like this is my dream but i have no idea how to do it yeah and i had no idea how to do it i was like i think you should probably just network with the people who run the conventions because i don't know i don't know the answer to this question (laughs) uh turns out the uh the solution is just to make better and more art Mm -hmm. (laughs) so no i'm guessing there's probably some other things that you've done as well oh well yeah i mean i've done a ton of research about um different conventions that i can do uh, that's the biggest one. It's just finding conventions to actually do. And you have a wonderful spreadsheet. Oh, I have. <laughs> I have many spreadsheets and okay. Google calendars. <laughs> yes. So I would love to dig into the spreadsheets and Google calendars, but we should probably structure the episode in like a logical way, okay. I guess. <laughs> um, so let, let's start off by telling people like what your business is, what it's called. If they want to check it out, where can they go find it? And then... Um, I guess like the the general gist, like how many cons do you do per month? What do you focus on? That kind of thing. Um, okay. Well, my online presence is called It's Raining Color. And I have an Instagram, a Twitter, a Facebook, Tumblr, a website. Um, pretty much all of my tags are It's Raining Color, um, except on Tumblr, it's, it's dash raining dash color. And then my website is just It's Raining Color.com. I also have a store envy. So if you want to, you know. I think you have more (laughs) platforms than I do. Well, (laughs) it's really hard to be an artist. You kind of need to be on a lot of different different platforms if you want to be successful, which, I mean, I'm getting there. My hack for being an artist is just to shove my art into things that people need, (laughs) like how to organize your files. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's going to be buying that at a convention. (laughs) You never know. You never know. Welcome to the Thomas Frank booth. You can buy signed, framed stills from my videos here's um here's me gesticulating wildly i mean look like you did those really ugly pokemon that one time there was someone at the convention this past weekend selling ugly pokemon stickers and people loved them really so well you also did undertale buttons that were in a similar style well they're in the style of the game kind of so i guess there's even a game where the style is kind of irreverent and yeah it's not focusing on like the craziest art quality but it's still good well yeah Hmm. so so what you're saying is i should go back to drawing ugly pokemon i'm saying you should completely (laughs) quit quit your entire business and you know start being starving artist like me i'm learning obviously good job i could do it 
Yeah, procreate. Do you want me? Do you want me just? We could. I could just quit right now. We could both do it. Uh, I don't, <laughs> walk off might, the set. Uh, yep. Bye. bye. <laughs> no. Uh, okay. we might have some financial issues. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna do that. We, we probably will have some financial issues if I do that. <laughs> anyway, I'll just continue sneaking art into. That's probably my videos. That's probably the best way for you to do as that. Easter eggs. But yeah, so you have a lot of platforms. Uh, which one is the most important? Do you think? Um. Well, I used to like Instagram best, but they keep changing the algorithms on there, making it really hard for someone with less than like 10,000 followers to get out there more. Just it's been really tough lately. Mm -hmm. So um, I think as far as like the best ones for me, it's definitely Instagram and um, Tumblr, actually. Okay. Well, at least for my style of art, for sure. Like Tumblr has been really helpful to me um, just because... I think it's the reblogging feature. Yeah. Just because like there's like an ability to share even, something. Even if I don't have like I think I have like three hundred something followers on Tumblr right now, which is not a lot, but every once in a while I'll post something that gets like a thousand reblogs. So And you did yeah. that that uh, emerging artist scene last year yeah, and I got yeah. what was it fourteen hundred reblogs or something? Or? No, that's like six hundred. Okay. <laughs> Boy, I'm bad with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you just like pumping your friends up, you know? I do. Yeah. You just have to, yeah, you have to <laughs> elevate people, you know? Yeah. Like <laughs> making me sound a lot cooler than I am. <laughs> I just remember you being really excited about how well that posted. Because I, I thought it would get like 50 and I got like 600. And how that, many applications did you get? It's like, I don't know, like 600. That's not really. So it was 600 reblogs and, oh no, maybe it was like 1400 notes in general. Then, no, it was like, like 600 that. something notes. And then it got like. Wow. You had a one to one note to application well ratio. i mean i also posted it on twitter too so. okay that's still pretty cool though yeah but i mean that that's not really super related to my art yeah personally but it was a cool project it was a cool project yeah so for art in general you think tumblr is still at least for you the best place to build your <sighs> online presence i don't know just i think also the other thing is that tumblr is just dying mm. slowly because of you know choices they made managerial decisions yes yeah but um i've actually been seeing a lot of artists go over to twitter more really okay yeah um just because it also has that reblogging feature or i guess retweeting yeah on, on twitter but yeah I, a lot of artists i know are starting to go over over to twitter instead which i'm trying to but i'm just not i'm not great at twitter <laughs> Twitter's so, hard. Twitter for me, it's like I post a lot more of my personal stuff on there rather than my art. Like I'll post my art on there every once in a while, but yeah. it's more of like me commenting on things that happen in the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I feel like Twitter to is my, like, really good to make conversation. Five but... followers that I have. <laughs> and I have like more like 200 followers, but. But yeah, it's it's hard to use Twitter as a broadcast platform. Yeah. yeah no. I think, you know, if I look at my website analytics, Twitter is like 0.001% yeah. people had come in or something like actually, that actually something interesting happened on twitter um i did some fan art for a a book series that i really like mm -hmm. and the author ended up retweeting both of those pieces of art and that was really cool because they got like hundreds and hundreds of retweets and stuff like that so nice um, is that shades of magic yeah. Nice. Yeah. The E. Schwab, Go Read Shades of Magic, guys. It's, it's a good book series. It's the best. It's my favorite. It's, I think, the one book series <laughs> that you successfully convinced me to read. Yeah. All the way through. Yeah. It was worth it. It took a lot of <laughs> nagging you. So you were like halfway through the third one and then you didn't read it for months. And I was like, just finish it. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got kind of stuck and then went off and read something else. Look, in my defense, how long did it take me to get you to read Name of the Wind? L look. <laughs> 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 I have no defense <laughs> prepared for this attack on my personality. I feel right personally now. attacked. I am attacked right now. <laughs> but listen, I read it eventually, and I said, if if I read Shade or uh, Name of the Wind, then you have to read the last Shades of Magic book, and then I read both Name of the Wind books, and then you didn't even start it till months afterwards. But I eventually did but it. But you, yes, yes, you did. But still, <laughs> there was a while there where I was convinced you weren't gonna. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't timely, but I held up my end of the bargain eventually, I guess. Yes, you did. Yes. Anyway. All right. 
So I have I have many questions for you. Okay. Um, but I guess the first one I'm curious about is uh, how has the last year or so of selling at cons been? Because you made what was it two and a half thousand in August? In August, I made about twenty eight hundred. That's not profit though. That's just it's pure revenue. Like yeah, pure like gross. Okay. Um, income there. Um. So I started out, my first convention was a really small one up in Colorado, or I guess down in Colorado Springs. And, and how long ago was that? That was February of 2018. Okay, so so the first con was a year and a half ago. Yeah. So it took you a year and a half to get to this point. Yes. Cool. So yeah, my first one, I made, this is, once again, I, I don't talk in like numbers of profit. I talk in purely like how, like the exact number that I made yeah um so uh, like a gross <coughs> revenue yeah I keep hitting that sorry <laughs> gosh you're hitting the mic but um <laughs> so yeah the first one i think i made like 450 dollars and i was like that's, that's not bad for your that's first that's pretty con. cool like oh yeah. 400 dollars that's pretty neat um especially for my first one and it was pretty small mm -hmm. and then i had a couple not great ones after that but let's see, July of last year, 2018, um, I went to Anime Iowa, which is obviously back in Iowa where, where we're from. And it's a convention that I had been going to ever since I was about 14 years old. And, and it was always like my dream to sell there because it was my home con and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I applied, got in, which I was super stoked about. And it ended up being my first convention that I made over a thousand dollars at. That's right. Yeah. So. And then you were able to sell there again this year, right? Yeah. And nice. I made $500 more than last year. So I made a lot of money. That's cool. awesome. Yeah, it was pretty neat. So now uh, here's the question: Was was Anime Iowa bigger this year than last year? I actually think it had lower attendance. So what do you attribute the additional revenue to? Was it just I, more stock? I honestly better position? don't know. You don't know. I think okay. I think they set up the room a lot better. Okay. I think I had more and better stuff than I did last year. Mm -hmm. And. Beyond that, I honestly don't know because it really did seem like it was lower attendance. But then after I counted everything at the end, I was like, wow, I made way more than I thought I was going to. Um, another thing that was weird about that one this year is that so I sell like a variety of different types of items. Um, I sell like prints and I sell pinback buttons and keychains and, you know, all this stuff. I don't know. People who have gone to Comic-Con probably know what I'm talking about. People selling, like, all sorts of different items. Anybody who's seen my backpack video has probably seen the buttons, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> usually my biggest seller is my little pinback buttons that I that I have um, because just because they're so cheap. They're, like, $2. So it's really easy for someone to just come up and hand $2 to me and say, I want that one. Yeah. At this one, however... My biggest seller was my prints, which I get a much higher margin on. And by this one, you mean this year's a Anime, Anime Iowa. Iowa. Okay. This year's Anime Iowa was like the only convention I've experienced so far where I sold mostly prints instead of small things. Hmm. So that helped a lot. I don't know why that happened. And how much is a print but I usually? I wasn't complaining. <laughs> um, they're 15, I, I sell them for $15. Okay. So you like, probably get a pretty darn good margin on that. Yeah. At least in terms of cost what is it cost of goods sold yeah 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 breaking out my business education yeah so um so i went from small like probably less than a thousand people went to the first con convention i ever sold at and then i went to let's see i did denver comic-con this year and that was the biggest one you've that done was so the far, biggest right? one i've ever done so far what was the attendance on that that's about one hundred and fifteen thousand people crap yeah i mean i've been massive. to it i believe it but it's still it's a huge number to hear yeah and i feel really lucky just because i've heard like a lot of people have a hard time getting to the point where i'm at even after they've been doing it for several years and somehow within a year and a half i went from you know that first galaxy fest to where i am now which is kind of astounding actually mm -hmm. so i want to dig into that like what do you think are the factors that have helped you get into so many cons? 
Um, and I guess it is worth telling people who are listening to this, like, there have also been quite a few rejections. Oh, even now. I get, honestly, still get t- way more rejections than I get acceptances. I had, actually, I don't think I've gotten an official, like, acceptance letter from a major con since, like, March. But that's okay, because I've, I've had, um, this year's been pretty full, actually. So mm-hmm. it's mostly just trying to book for next year at this point. But... Um, see factors that help me get in. I think having a really nice portfolio is really important where mm-hmm. it show like some somewhere that showcases just my art so that when I apply to one, they can click on my my portfolio link and all my art is just there for them to see mm-hmm. and they don't have to go hunting for it because I guarantee if I had, if I had just put like my Instagram on there or something, I don't think I would be getting into as many cons as I do just because I post, I post works in progress on my Instagram. I post like promotional posts. I don't post just my art. Yeah. So. So your Instagram is not really a portfolio. It's not really Because it's not tailored. No, it's not at all. Yeah. And there's actually some conventions that say that you're not even allowed to apply with your social media account. Really? Yeah. So they want a legit portfolio yeah. site. Okay. Yeah. Or, you know, like a deviant art or, you know, just not art Instagram or, or something. Twitter or something like that. Yeah. So I honestly think that's like one of the biggest things that has helped is like having all of my art in like one place. It's really easy. When it comes to making your portfolio, are you putting everything up in chronological order or is there like For a the most part, rhyme to your reason? I recently went through and took out some of my older stuff. Mm-hmm. But generally, once I finish something, I'll just throw it up on my website and it's all in chronological order. So. Okay. Yeah. So you think portfolio is probably the biggest factor then? Has there any been has there been any kind of like networking so that has gotten you into cons? It's so or? hard to know. I mean, like the smallest bit I was able to do one. Um, because one of my friends who was selling at conventions before me said, Hey, I have a table at this one. If you want, I can like let you have a little corner of my table for you to sell your art at. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was like way back at the beginning. That was only my second convention after Galaxy Fest. Um, yeah. I didn't do great at that one, but it was fine because I didn't have to pay for it. So that, that is because nice. my friend, my friend let me have part of her table. So um, beyond that, I haven't really had any success networking into any artist alleys now. Mm. So my one idea is, was bust. I mean, I haven't really <laughs> tried, but it's also like it's just it's not the most efficient way at all. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right that having just a stellar portfolio yeah, and, and probably secondarily having a following because then, like, especially if it's big, they oh, can yeah. big, market that you're coming. Oh, my gosh, but. yeah, no. I think, like, a really big reason that I haven't gotten into a lot of the bigger ones is just because I'm not a famous artist like Sakimi-chan or Yume or mm-hmm. Ross Draws or Giris or, you know, all those people. Um and unfortunately, that's just not something that I can control. Yeah, getting a big platform as an artist is yeah, a tough proposition. It's just, it's, it's slow going. Mm-hmm. It's getting there. But I'm hoping that at some point my art's just so good that even if I don't have that much of a following, I can still get into those big ones. That's like a whole nother avenue of discussion. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I, I, I have no idea how you do that. In fact, maybe I should do an interview with an artist that's at like a huge social platform Maybe. level and just ask him like, what do you think are the biggest factors Yeah, that bring you up? It's just posting every day, which I don't and don't really care to do. I don't know if you <laughs> post every single day though. Cause aren't there artists who don't? Yeah, no, they don't. Mm. <laughs> but maybe that's because they already have their huge following. They don't need to. That could be. Yeah. I don't know. In the YouTube world, it's if one person gets big by posting every day. One person gets big by posting, uh, in Bill Wirtz's case, once a year. <laughs> Yeah. That uh, History of Japan video, he took, Yikes. I think, a full, it was either one or two full years before the next big viral video. Oh, goodness. But then it just immediately got 20 million views. Oh. So. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, who knows indeed. But it's it's actually worth noting that even with a relatively small platform, it's what, 1,000 followers on Instagram, 300 on Twitter or Tumblr, uh, you're still getting into enough cons that you're going to one a month at least, right? Um, there's been a few months this year where I haven't had any. Um, and then there's been months this year where I have multiple. So, 
Didn't you have three in April? I had four in a row in yeah. April, and it was oh, I I do not want to do that again. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. too much, but it was it was a good experience. But oh, I was very tired at the end of the second one, and I was like, oh goodness, I still have two more to do. Oh, Ooh. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. I was not Many probably late a, a super spent prepping. Yeah, not not super pleasant to be around. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. well, that reminds me, I want to ask about your setup at some point. Um, but I want to dig into the money side of it okay? because I know you have to pay for table fees, right? Yes. And then if you're traveling, you have to pay for either a flight or driving and then lodging unless you can find someone to stay with. Right. So since you don't know how much you're going to make at a con and since like even AI can vary by $500 year to year, um, are there any factors that you use to decide whether or not it's worth traveling, whether or not it's worth getting a hotel yeah so i've been pretty fortunate to make a few friends um at the conventions i've gone to so far who have a lot more experience than i do so they were willing to give me some advice in that regard Mm -hmm. um so basically i found that my personal art style does really good amongst anime fans okay and so when I'm looking for an anime convention to sell at, I basically look for um, the, uh, oh, sorry, an attendance above 6,000 people mm-hmm. because according to one of my friends, that's generally where they have found that it's worth it even to like fly okay. to a convention is if it's above 6,000 people. For Comic-Cons, I'd say it needs to be above 10,000. So 15, comic 000. fans don't buy as much as anime fans for my art style i would say no yeah they don't they don't go as much for my art style just because why do you think that because your art isn't just anime art yeah but it's the style is very anime Mm, okay yeah and i do a lot of fandoms from like anime and video games Mm -hmm. and that just generally that crowd tends to like the fan those fandoms more yeah um oh wait and i guess we were also saying that the at the comic cons people are uh, um, they're yeah, buying photos yeah with yeah people. so yeah another thing at comic cons is that the attendees are paying all of their money to see celebrities instead of in the in the artist alley mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily true for every con but when a celebrity is charging four hundred dollars to take a photo with them it makes it a little <laughs> difficult and you're already paying you know eighty dollars to get into the convention in the first place mm-hmm. That's like that might that right might there. be the only thing that p- someone buys at that convention is uh, a picture with their favorite celebrity, which is totally valid, super cool, but mm-hmm. it hurts. But sometimes. it means that it's it's harder for you. The, to make yeah. Any of so those. there was a convention I did last year. I think it. I think I spent about eight hundred dollars just to be at that convention between um, plane tickets, lodging, the booth fee, which was almost three hundred dollars itself. That's really high. Yeah. Is it the um, highest one you've paid? Yeah. Yikes. So, and then the plane ticket was like 400 The lodging was like 300 So that's just a monstrously expensive so, trip. And that's the it was only... hugely one. And that is the only one where I've lost money. Yeah. And it, was it the only it was one you've fl- you flown to as well? Yes. Or, okay. Well, we technically flew to Dem- Demicon this year, but that was for that's a true. family trip as well. Yeah. But yeah, so that one was a huge bust. That was the, that was the only one where I, ne- I didn't make any profit at all. Now that was... Um, well, I guess they're not actually called Comic Con anymore, right? They're <laughs> no, like pop they're not culture con or something. Expos, or? comic expo is really common for them to use now. Okay, but was that one like similar size to Denver Comic Con? No, much smaller. It was smaller. Okay, yeah. but it was like sixty thousand people. Still, I should have made more money there than I did. But I actually had a friend who went there this year and said. And they were, so I think part of the reason I didn't do well there was my location was really bad. Mm -hmm. But I had a friend go this year who was in the main part, had probably a decent location. And they said that that was also the only con that they've lost money at. That was in Silicon Valley, right? Yeah. Maybe people just don't have. I'm not going to name drop. (laughs) But we'll we'll, we'll just say it's in a very, very expensive area to live in. Yeah. So You would expect people to go there and spend a lot of money, but. They don't, apparently. So Well, I have to wonder if it's the opposite. Like, do people just not have a whole lot of money to spend Maybe on not. random art? Like, they just have enough money to go into the con and that's it? I don't know. But, don't yep, know. they said that was yep the only con they lost money at. Same with me. So, mm-hmm. glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> do you have, like, a, like, oh, I'll fly if it's this big. I'll drive if it's this big. 
I won't that kind at of this thing. point I won't drive if it's more than eight hours away. Okay. So cons for me to fly to for an anime convention it would need to be at least six thousand people and for a comic convention it would need to be at least ten or fifteen thousand, I'd say. Okay. If I'm gonna fly to it. And if it's more than eight hours away, I'm I'm not gonna drive. Gotcha. Yeah, no. Eight hours is like my Except for Iowa, I will drive to Iowa because Iowa is my home. So there's there's more you can well, do my there. Previous home. Plus, if you just like put a broom handle in the steering wheel, then you can get across Nebraska <laughs> while sleeping. <laughs> that was a well, joke. You're not. We're not going to encourage anyone to do that, <laughs> that here. No, don't don't try that at home, kids. Though I think uh, the the first road that like a, the Tesla self driving could probably handle without any problems would be just I seven or I eighty going across Nebraska. Yep, it's. So drive straight pretty, for 10 hours it's pretty boring <laughs> this week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at skillshare which is a learning platform that has over 30,000 courses that can help you get a leg up in your career and improve your skills they've got courses in a ton of different topic areas ranging from marketing and big data and analytics to video editing to motion graphics design uh, productivity courses including a productivity course from yours truly and uh, i would recommend skillshare if not for anything else, just for that class. But again, there's over 30,000 other classes on the platform. Uh, and there are also lots of graphic design and illustration courses. So since we're doing an episode on becoming an artist and selling at Artist Alleys, I wanted to feature a couple of different courses on graphic design. Uh, also because you're a professional graphic designer yes, and you have your degree is, in it. That is what I went to school for. Exactly. So, so uh, I'm, the first one I'm gonna recommend is called Graphic Design, Boldly Design with Color and shape. And that is a class that you can take regardless of what tools you're using, regardless of what platforms you're working on. And just as talking about the general principles of graphic, uh, graphic design, which I'm sure as you know, there are a lot of like general principles like white space and color theory and all these things that are important to composition. learn. Yeah. Composition. That's another one. Um, putting llamas in as oh, many places as possible. That is the most important design rule. I think that's, yeah. And I think I've nailed that one. Yeah. So <laughs> you're basically a professional graphic designer. <laughs> Pretty much, you know, just enough farm animals and you're good to go. Uh, the other one that I wanted to recommend, though, is called Digital Illustration Learn to Use Procreate. So this is going to be a class that you would want to take if you have an iPad. And is Procreate only on the iPad Pro or is it the iPad as well? I think it's also I had Procreate on my old iPad. So, oh, cool. Okay. I think it's on there as well. Oh, that's right. The new Apple Pencil works on old iP or at least uh, non pro iPads. But I've actually started learning Procreate because I want to do some little illustrations for articles over on the College Info Geek blog. And uh, I've been looking through this course and a few of other courses just to kind of learn all the different techniques. It's a very interesting program. So going to recommend that if you have an iPad. If not, graphic, illus graphic illustration, boldly designed with color and shape is the one I'm going to recommend. Now, the great thing about Skillshare is that all their classes have an active learning component. Every teacher puts an example project that you can immediately sink your teeth into to start using the skills you're learning so you're not just sitting there passively and taking information. Additionally, there is a discussion section. So if you have questions or you wanna get feedback from either the teachers or the other students in the class, you can do that. Um, Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. Their monthly subscription is about the cost of Netflix, but of course it's a lot more useful to your future and your career. And if you go over to skillshare.com geek, you can get a two month free trial with unlimited learning. And there is a heck of a lot of learning you could do in two months. So once again, skillshare.com geek to get that two month unlimited free trial. Huge thanks goes out to Skillshare for sponsoring this episode, being a big supporter of our show. And a second big thanks goes out to our additional sponsor this week, Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning platform where you can more efficiently learn math, science, and computer science. And they build their library of over 50 different courses in a way where you are immediately thrown into tough, challenging, yet bite-sized problems that get you working actively as soon as possible. And not only does this help you more efficiently learn the subject, whether it's calculus or probability or statistics, gravitational physics or Python programming or computer memory, whatever it is, not only are you learning it more efficiently because you are actively working with problems the entire time, but it also keeps your level of interest higher and it helps you become a universally better 
problem solver. In any area of your life, you're going to be able to more effectively come up with creative, innovative solutions to the problems you face because you are stretching your problem solving muscles as you're going through these courses. Now, one of the great things about Brilliant is in addition to their library of over 50 courses, there is a daily challenges feature where you can make learning and problem solving a daily habit. If you've got five minutes a day, you can log in, you can solve a problem. And not only are you going to, again, stretch that problem solving muscle, but you might also get interested in a subject that you hadn't considered before. So with Brilliant's free plan, you get access to brand new daily challenges every single day. And if you want to upgrade to their premium subscription, you also get access to the entire archive of every daily challenge that has ever come out, plus access to all 50 of their courses in their course library. And if you want to get started, you can go over to brilliant.org slash college info geek. And if you're one of the first 200 people to use that link and sign up, you're going to get 20% off that annual premium subscription. Once again, brilliant.org slash college info geek. And once again, big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this episode and supporting our show let's get back into it okay so do you have any kind of influence over where you are in the con hall because i know nope. that so that's so well, it's kind of like there's some, there's some there's gambling some, going some on some conventions almost will let you like choose like actually fanex lets you pick like several tables that you'd prefer to be at and then they try to put you in one of those is there a strategy that's, that's not to where you'd want to be um well i was fortunate and got a, a corner booth for fanex mm -hmm. so generally those are more expensive because they do better in, in a corner like on on the on an aisle like if they're like the corner booths will just do better um so that's kind of where i'm at with fanex um there are some where they're first come first serve and you will actually select your table number and um pay for it that way it's not as common, though. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, you don't even know where your table is until you show up and check in at the convention itself. So usually it's just randomly assigned. Yeah. And it seems like your location actually does have an effect on your sales. Oh, it has a huge sales. effect. Yeah. Um, this last one I did last weekend, I was expecting lots of sales because it's a very big anime convention. However, I did fine at it, but I had a very bad location in the artist alley and i think i would have done a lot better even if i had had a better location so yeah location has a huge impact there mm. was actually like a massive like wall of people that stopped like right before our table were you like around a corner or something kind of yeah oh, okay so there was like this aisle like here and all of the artist alleys were going like that and we were like here oh so you were like in a weird offshoot yeah okay and the wall was like here. Just, yeah, no, it's not great. <laughs> and I remember you went to another con once where you were in like a secondary artist alley hall. That was you? that was the one I was just talking about a couple oh, minutes ago. Okay. The, the only one I, the only one I ever lost money at because there was a satellite, quote unquote, artist alley. That's that, like that uh, wasn't part of the main artist alley, and it was awful. Yeah, that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> it was terrible. Was the table fee the same as for the? Yes. Interesting. I wonder if like. As time goes on and as artists kind of learn more about how to navigate this sort of work, if conventions are going to be pressured to adopt more like standardized, you know, you pay more to be in this location, you pay less to be in that Yeah, location. well, that, that convention is only in like its third year, I think. So mm, okay. that would make sense that they would be doing that. Yeah. Um, not knowing that it's actually hurting people. But I mean, apparently even the main artist alley in that con isn't good either. So yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe that con's just i don't know maybe the demographics just don't have a whole lot of money to spend once they get in i don't know i mean it's yeah, it's I, hard to know yeah i don't know but um yeah a lot of doing this kind of work doing like going to conventions and selling art is a gamble mm -hmm. um because well the first gamble is applying to see if you even get in and yeah. then you don't know where you're going to be located and then you don't even know what kind of people are going to be there you don't know what kind of fandoms they're going to be in you don't know what kind of items they're going to want to buy the whole thing is very unpredictable like you mm. like the first convention i ever went to i sold a lot of like a specific fandom so i was like oh i guess i should focus more on that one well three cons later no one was buying that fandom and i had a bunch mm. of leftover stuff and i was like oh okay <laughs> So, so about... another important thing is like um, paying attention to like what shows, games, movies are really popular at the time mm -hmm. um, and then basing that or basing what kind of are you do on that as well. 
So right so. now it's like Inuyasha, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like Sanford and Son? I saw a whole zero pieces of Inuyasha fan art <laughs> at the convention I just went to. What is it right now? <sighs> My Hero Academia. Mm, okay. Still is huge. Still, okay. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be going away anytime soon. Mm. Let's see. Is One Punch Man still big? Because no, season two really. has been over for a little while. Yeah, no, that that one's not really that that big. I'm trying to think of oh, Fire Emblem's huge right now. Mm. Fire Emblem is because that game just came huge out huge right now. Oh, I bet you Astral Chain might get a little uh, bit. Do you think it's going to be too obscure? Yeah, uh, I don't think it. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. I doubt it. Good Omens is huge right now as well. Oh, we need to watch that show. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> Keep um, seeing it on Amazon. I'm I don't like, see I a ton it. of Good Omens fan art, but. It's like one of the biggest things on the internet right now is Good Omens. Do you see a lot of cosplay? Oh, so much cosplay. Because those goggles are pretty iconic. Oh my gosh, and... yeah, no. I, I can't even tell you how many Crowley cosplays I saw at the convention <laughs> this weekend. There was a ton, which is cool because, I mean, I've heard it's really good. Mm -hmm. um, also, what kind of products are really popular is something um, to consider. So right now, enamel pins are really popular. Okay. Um, which is why you're running a Kickstarter. That's for why I'm running a Kickstarter for enamel pins. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna shill myself too much, but <laughs> we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're pretty great. It's been funded already. Woo! Anyway, That's true. <laughs> so enamel pins, and um, then the pin back buttons are different, for, right? Yeah, for me, those are my biggest seller. Okay, and those are just like they're, they're not like those metal, little plasticky like, looking yeah. ones that you know they're just little circles. Like the vote for Pedro. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and then keychains, which are, um, they're like acrylic. Yeah, acrylic keychains. That's right. That have my art on them. Um, and prints. Those, yeah. Well, so the most popular items that are, I see selling at conventions right now are mostly like enamel pins, keychains, like small things. Just because people at this point either have run out of wall space because they already have too much art mm -hmm. <laughs> or they just can't afford it anymore. So I was reading about like the fashion industry a couple of months ago and um, you know, everyone asks like, they have all these runway shows in Milan and all that kind of stuff with mm -hmm. the most ridiculous outfits. And Sorry. I guess like the average person is like, I would never wear this weird spiky box on my head. Why is that what's in right now? It's and I guess the explanation is that's not what's in. That's just like the companies are doing something outlandish to gather attention. And then that just gets people in the door and then they like buy the same pair of like, you know, normal looking Oxford shoes or something. Right. So do you feel like prints are sort of a similar deal where a print just gets people over to your booth and then Oh they yeah, buy? that's definitely definitely a huge thing. Like, um display is a huge factor in how many sales you get as well. Mm -hmm. Um so the prints, the the giant wall of prints, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, like your scaffolding yeah. metal folding yeah panels i guess yeah so i the biggest reason i have that there is just to get people over to my table because it works really well mm -hmm. because they see oh colorful pretty art let's go over there and then they see all my other stuff and then they buy something and it's great <laughs> and usually it's not a print uh, or sometimes it is sometimes it is sometimes they'll they'll come over for the to look at the prints and then they'll see that i have buttons and they'll be like oh and then they'll look at those mm -hmm. so yeah, definitely like big things to get people's attention right away helps a lot. And is there anything you've been able to do to boost sales that? for like buttons? <laughs> oh, for buttons? Oh, well, yeah. So I used to just sell them individually, but uh, let's see. Back in January, I started selling like the same fandom buttons as sets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I did a bunch of Studio Ghibli buttons or Ghibli, I don't, I don't know. I hear people say it both ways now. I think it's Ghibli. <laughs> Ghibli. <laughs> um, so I have a whole, uh, I had a whole set of those that I used to sell individually, and then I was like, what if I just package them all together and make them slightly cheaper? And it just exploded. Like people buy those like crazy. So just bundles, the sets. bundles yeah. is good. Yeah, because they see, oh, it's a whole set of this fandom that I love, and then they just throw money at me. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that's a good point is bundling stuff together into a deal always gets people to buy more. So 
for individual buttons, I, I do like $2 a piece, but then if they buy three, it's $5, so it's a dollar off. So mm. if I say, oh, they're $2 a piece, um, but they're also three for five, they're like, oh, I'm totally buying five, uh, three then. Yeah. Um, and I get more money from that. And same with the prints. I do, if you buy two, you get a third one for free. Um, since those are higher costs, people don't usually jump on that quite as fast as they do the buttons, but they yeah. still do. Um, I, do the I same noticed for that when chains. I was at Comic-Con, yeah. they were doing bundles and I was like, well, I don't want to spend 75 bucks. Yeah. So I'll just get one. But yeah. with buttons, it seems so like it's, $2, yeah, it's, $5. Yeah. Cause yeah. Some of them, they're getting like five buttons for $7 instead mm -hmm. of like nine or something. Wait, you do five buttons for seven as well? No. Oh. That's just if they're in a set together. Oh, right. You're uh, the bundles. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's for the bundles. And then... I do the same for keychains, and I have a a sticker set of like six different characters from one fandom. Mm -hmm. And if people, if I see people are kind of like, they're like, oh, I don't know which ones I want. Maybe like these three. And I'm like, well, if you buy the whole set, it's you get a sticker for free. And then they, go, oh, I'll go the whole get the whole set then. So just stuff like that gets mm -hmm. people to get more a little more excited and willing to throw money. <laughs> that gives me a good question. Okay. So I mean. You you would be the first to admit that you're an introvert, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> How does that work with selling at it a convention? Like it takes so much energy. Okay. I yes. Yeah, so I see people at conventions who are very obviously extroverts, and they've told me such. And I'm like, that, you're so lucky because I have to use so many spoons mm -hmm. at a convention, which is why when I did four in a row, by the end of it, I was just like, I don't want to talk to anyone for a week. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. I think of actually a lot of it is the, of what has helped me is I have uh, my best friend who usually comes to the convention and helps me. Uh, she'll just sit at the booth with me or if I have to go use the restroom or if I have to go grab some food or I just want to break and walk around mm -hmm. and look at stuff for a bit. Um, she can sit there and take care of it while I'm gone. And she is really good at selling stuff for me. <laughs> Um, just because I, especially at first, I'm, I'm not great at like selling my own stuff. So when you say at first, is it like at first, because like at your first, first when I started, yeah, or when I, yeah, do you have to yeah. warm up first, for every single convention? Well, no, I, I meant when I first started conventions, I okay. was just, I kind of sat there and was like, I don't really know what to say to people. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'll buy something. I don't know. I don't want to like be really obnoxious and salesy. So I guess I'll just sit here. But then like, I would observe her being like, oh, you came back for a second time to look at this thing. That means you should probably buy it. And I was just <laughs> like, oh my gosh, you're so like salesy and i'm not <laughs> she's like you shouldn't feel bad about it it's like have you picked up any tricks i've definitely her? picked up a few okay so at this point i think basically if you're an introvert try to come up with like it sounds like bad but try to come up with a bit of like a little script thing that you say to people when mm -hmm. they come to your booth um honestly i think the most important thing is is just greeting people when they walk by which it's hard but Literally, all you have to do is say, hi, how's your day going? And yeah. then that's it. Usually, like, I will just say that, and then they'll look at stuff, and I'll just leave them alone because I don't want to be really obnoxious. Mm -hmm. um, another strategy I use is if someone's in a cosplay or if they're wearing a T-shirt from a fandom that I have art of, I'll be like, oh, hey, I have art of that character here if you want to look at it. And they'll be like, oh, cool, and they'll come over and look at it, and a lot of times they'll buy it. Um, that's smart. Yeah, so... Yeah, that was definitely something that Meg started doing before me. Mm -hmm. Meg is my helper that I was just talking about. Yeah, she would she would see uh, like a cosplayer and be like, oh, look, we have you on a button right here. And then they'll be like, oh, cool. So I started doing that. Um, so I think group. it's just, yeah, I know. I think it's just because she was worked in retail for so long. So she's more used to doing that than me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. You worked a little bit of retail, though. I have, but I was never really that good at being really salesy. Mm. And they never really pushed me that hard <laughs> to be really salesy. So. Same. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess we make our living selling things on the internet, but in the softest way possible. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as trying to be more extroverted goes, I, I mentioned like sort of having a little script. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll start with high 
are you having a fun day at the convention? And they'll, you know, answer. And then if I see they're looking at buttons, I'll say, um, buttons are $2 each or three for $5 in case you were interested in multiple. Mm -hmm. Um, if they're looking, so I, I don't have enough room for all of my prints on my display anymore. So I have like a little portfolio that I have on my table. So I say, um, I have way more prints in this portfolio than I have room for up here. So please feel free to look through this and see if there's anything else that interests you. Just that kind of thing. Like, basically, you don't have to strike up a new conversation with every single person that comes to your booth. Just, yeah. like, having a little bit of, like, even just a little mental script that you say, say to people really helps. And you're just giving them, like, a little tour, essentially. Yeah. And the times that I've really had fun is if someone will strike up a conversation with me about, like, one of the fandoms I have, and then we'll have, like, a good conversation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think... A really important thing to remember is if you're an introvert, a lot of other people at the convention are an introvert as well. Um, so you're among friends mm -hmm. and no one's going to be mad at you for being an introvert. <laughs> it is kind of but also, a group of fandoms that attract a lot of introverts. Yeah, it's kind of an introverty thing, mm -hmm. reading comics and stuff like that. So just remember that you all kind of like the same things. So... It's not that scary to talk to people about it. Yeah. And you might even make new friends. That's so. true. So I want to get into some numbers. Again? Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I want to go back into the numbers. Look, this I'm a math kind of like nerd kind of guy. You know this. You've been dealing <laughs> with me. See, I'm the opposite, which is why I do <laughs> art and not math. <laughs> yeah, but you have spreadsheets. So. I do have spreadsheets. I don't so. really use them for numbers. but Well, we'll talk about the spreadsheets in a minute. But I, I guess I want to know um, in terms of like what it takes to produce and what you can sell it for, like what are the margins and I guess price for creation and what you sell it for, for like the buttons and the prints and then the pins and the keychains. Uh, <laughs> Cause like a, a print is 15 bucks, right? Yeah. You <laughs> do you not know? What do you mean? Like all the, all the prices. Have you like broken it down per piece or not? What do you mean prices? Like how much I pay for them? Yeah. Like how much and you then pay how much I print. sell <laughs> Oh, I know. I just, <laughs> it might seem kind of skeezy. Well, it's not skeezy because you're also going to the con. I mean, this is the thing, that's, right? That's like, You order prints, but <laughs> so we're talking about cost of goods sold, right? Because people want to <laughs> get into this. You also, and I guess people need to know this, you also need to drive or fly to the con. Yeah. Pay the table fee, pay for a hotel a lot of times. And I have to pay to be extroverted or seem extroverted to you all for like that's 10 true. hours a day. Yeah. <laughs> but... Um, so I will say that or if I, you don't, if you don't want to give me numbers, just like what's <laughs> the best, I guess, what's like the best thing to produce? Um, I don't know. I think I make the most off of my prints right now. Okay. But I, I don't mind saying it. I just don't want people to be like, oh man, convention artists are ripping us off. They're, we're, we're not. <laughs> I think if they were ripping you off, then other people would have started undercutting. That's but fair. But they haven't. So it's. Yeah. So I, I'll just say it. I pay about 70 cents per print and i sell them for 15 dollars. okay <laughs> so it's a pretty good margin it's a, it's a pretty good mar margin on just production cost yes but yeah you know again you never know how much you're gonna make at a con versus how much it costs yeah to get there exactly exactly um and how it's, what's it's, like, it's, what it's are actually, the quantities you have to order i usually order my prints in about 10 per design okay um that's for the more popular ones. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do like five per design on my less popular ones. Um, and that's actually pretty low compared to some of my other friends who do this just because I don't sell as much posters. I sell mostly buttons. Yeah. Um, and so buttons I don't... you can make on demand, right? Yes, which is really nice. Um, button wise, I'd say, oh, I can't really do the math in my head right now, but. I sell them for $2 a piece. I probably, it's probably much less than a dollar per button that mm -hmm. I spend. Because you, you print out the I, button designs print, yourself. Yeah, I print, I so I have my own printer and I have a really fancy cutting machine, which is super nice. So I do buttons and stickers at home. I don't outsource those. Mm -hmm. um, I outsource my keychains and my prints and going forward i will also be outsourcing um enamel pins once i once i have those just because who who, who can make those they don't no one has the equipment for that except 
Yeah, I got like a hammer down <laughs> in the garage and some paint brushes. I could take a but crack at it. <laughs> there's actually some things that I sell for less money than my posters, but I actually have to pay more per piece. So like my keychains right now, mm-hmm. I pay like three dollars per keychain on those, and I only sell them for twelve. Really? Okay. Yeah. And I'm actually looking for a new a new keychain manufacturer right now because that's just too expensive for me. So like, for the keychains, is it just like a, I really want these to exist kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. But, um, yeah, I've talked to some of my friends and they've told me they've been willing to tell me which manufacturers they use that are much cheaper. So I'm mm-hmm. gonna give that a shot, um, just because three dollars per keychain right now is just way too high. Yeah. It's it's too high. <laughs> And plus you have to pay plus you have to pay for shipping and all that stuff. That's true. I guess there is also shipping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, there's that. How do you know what to order? Are you like tallying how many of each poster gets sold or I used to do that sometimes I know I I really know I should keep track of inventory while I'm at con, but sometimes I'm bad and I don't because I'm just lazy. Mm -hmm. But um Yeah, actually when I was doing the tally mark thing, it helped me try to figure out um kind of like how much how much I need of everything. At this point, I have a pretty good idea of what are my most popular stuff. It's My Hero Academia and Studio Ghibli. Okay. That are, those are my... Those, for you those, specifically? For me specifically, those two button sets, the Studio Ghibli and the um, My Hero Academia ones are probably the things I sell the most mm-hmm. out of all of my items, including my prints and keychains and stickers and everything. Interesting. And so, is it mostly the bundles? Yes. Cool. Um. So after a convention, I will, I'll come home and I'll look through all of, like I have a, all my, my buttons and I'll, I'll do inventory and count them. And I'll be like, oh, well, I know I had like 20 of this one button before the convention and now I only have like two. So that one did really well. Okay. So you're kind of like mentally on top of I'm pretty, where yeah, you were for most yeah, things. Yeah. It's weird that I'm not good at like math and stuff like that or, um, I mean, I'm I'm not bad at it, but I just don't really put that much effort into it. Well, I don't. You're not much I don't of really a manual do, tracking kind of person. I'm not. I don't really have. I don't track my my budget in anywhere that's like physical or on the internet or anything like that. Because for some reason, I'm pretty good at keeping track of like where I think I'm at in my head. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of times, it'll be like, I I think I have this much in the bank, so I think I can afford this thing I want to buy. And I'll look and I'll be like, Oh, I was right. Cool. <laughs> Um, it's like guessing the time. It's like having a weird mental budget kind of thing or like I've spent a lot this week or I spent a lot of money last week, so I can't really spend that much this week. I have to, you know, slow down a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know why because everyone else I know like has ways of manually keeping track of all that stuff. And I'm just like, it's just kind of I a do it all in my head. <laughs> I, I know. like crazy to do applications yeah, and you're like, no. we've had we've had discussions about this where you're just like, <laughs> I have like 15 different applications where I keep all my to do lists and notes and everything and i'm just like wow i use like a paper notebook and sometimes <laughs> evernote and that's good enough for me there are so, multiple valid ways man yeah it's crazy like if i had as many like note taking and to-do list tracking things as you did i think i would honestly go insane like it would be too much <laughs> i'm a little ridiculous you're the opposite you would go insane <laughs> if you didn't have that amount of stuff and i, I would just like, things would slip through the cracks for me I would, I would straight forget them. You also just have way more things to do than I do. There are a lot of irons in the fire. But I, the, I, I also like... But I mean, you have a lot of cons. You have application Yeah, deadlines. I have a lot of stuff. I I don't know. I'm just like in my head, I'm pretty good at mentally keeping track of like mm-hmm. remembering everything I have to do. It, it, it's weird. I, I feel like I'm bragging. But <laughs> it's, I think you're just, you're just saying how you are yeah, productive. So I generally have an idea of like what are my best sellers in my head Mm -hmm. and I don't usually have to like it's not necessary for me to physically keep track of it yeah definitely helps but so you haven't had too many times you're like oh no I sold out of something that's happened sometimes but that's mostly because I didn't like I thought I had more of something than I did Mm -hmm. so there's sometimes when the you know mentally keeping track of stuff fails but and there's also times when I'm like well I don't really need to make more of this because it usually doesn't do very well and then of course that's the con where that that's the one thing that everyone wants I'm like yeah Okay, cool. I guess this is <laughs> I didn't the, plan for this. The, the time when it gets um, confusing because it depending on the time, there are new anime coming out that are going to be popular. Right. But then every con is going to have different, different things that yeah, those exactly. people are into. Yeah, exactly. So. 
So like, it's pretty actually, hard. there were several things this weekend that I sold out this past weekend that I sold out of. Um, I have some Futurama things mm-hmm. um, that I don't usually restock just because every other con I, I don't really sell them at all. However, at this one, of course, was the one where everyone wanted Futurama stuff for some reason. So I was like, well, sold out of that real quick. Yeah. Great. <laughs> but my, my brain is now like going through potential ideas of like, oh, could you use like localized Twitter data to figure no, out what the biggest fandom is? too much be? effort. <laughs> too much effort. But that's actually, I'm struggling right now with my next convention, which is um, FanX in Utah, which is next weekend. Mm-hmm. So if anyone's listening to this right now and you live in Utah and you're going to FanX, you may, might come come see me. Oh my time. gosh. Yeah. This is actually coming. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so like to full disclosure, we're doing this episode because Martin's house got infested by bugs. So we can't do the episode. And I was like, I guess I have to do an episode of my own. And then you were like, oh, I could be on the show. Yeah. Uh, and, but it's actually <laughs> kind of have perfect. a joke, but then you liked it. So. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause we were going to do our original topic and I was like, wait a minute. You're, you're, you just like this month you hit what you make for your job in side income. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a perfect thing to talk about. But yeah, you're going to be at Fanex. I am going to be so at Fanex next anybody weekend. Anybody in Salt so. Lake City, you know, go see Anna. Yeah. Um, speaking of cons, how do you find cons? There's a few websites I use. Okay. Um, one of them is called, I have it right here in front of me, actually. Um, one of them is called notes? animecons.com. One of them is called fancons.com. Okay. Um, one of the ones I really like is artistalleyconfidential.com because they, uh, um, it's a platform where you can post reviews for the Artist Alley specifically. So like people will post reviews for like how they did at that Artist Alley, what the attendance was like, that kind Ooh, of thing. So it's really, good. it's really nice. So I, I go on there a lot. Like if I find out about a convention I'm interested in, I'll go on there and see, you know, generally how people think of that con and mm-hmm. see if it's worth going to. Um, getconned.com is also a good one because they actually have a they have embedded in their website a massive spreadsheet of hundreds and hundreds of cons and most of them list out the re- most recent attendance record and they'll have a link to the website um, what kind of con it is et cetera, the dates, location, all that kind of stuff. So GitCon is great. How do you spell that one? Because I feel like if I type that wrong, I'm going to get my bank information stolen. <laughs> G- G-E-T-C-O-N-N-E-D.com. Okay. Get, okay. GetConned.com. Gotcha. It sounds really bad, but it's, it's just it's, it's just a little pun. Um, yeah. And then the other one that might have weird spelling is Artist Alley Confidential. Um it's a really long thing to spell out. Just the word alley, like art. It's art. It's cat. actually artists. Oh, artists. Alley. Artists alley confidential dot com. Okay, and we'll put all of this in the and show this, notes. Yeah, we'll put so. all of this stuff in the show notes. Um, but one of the one of the best ways that I've found to find cons is actually just to at a con ask your um, table mate or I guess your um, neighbor, table neighbor, or mm-hmm. you know try to make friends, see what cons they suggest. Because a lot of them won't be on those websites. Yeah. So honestly, word of mouth is one of the best ways to um, to find new stuff. Especially because if they have experience with that con, they can give you better advice about like what does well at that con, or like what the attendance mm. was like at that con, how much money. Like I'm really lucky, and I have friends that actually are willing to tell me how much money they made at a specific con. Yeah. Um, which. Do you Some find people that people aren't. are like kind of secretive? In I this? think I think that's just an American thing. Honestly, it's like people mm. are so, like, it's like rude to ask or tell about like how much money you make, which mm. I think is weird. But yeah, um, I mean, I get it, sort of. But I have no problem telling people, um, especially if you're if they're trying to get into this business. I have no problem telling people how much money I make at a con. Yeah. Just because it just that's, seems that's like there's so much room for expansion because you have their big cons, but there's, I mean, you've been going to cons that I've never heard of. Sometimes yeah. they're small and you still do really well. And yeah. I feel like the more artists yeah. we have, the more cons there's going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And you've done really well at some pretty small shows. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdly. So this last weekend I was at Nondesk Con, which is the biggest anime con in Colorado, as far as I know. Mm-hmm. The weekend before that, I went to Fort Collins Comic Con, which is up in Fort Collins, about an hour away from Denver. Um, and that one's really small. 
least I thought it was. It's pretty. It, it is pretty small. It takes place in their little community center there. Mm-hmm. I made more money there than like <sighs> bigger cons that happened elsewhere. Yeah, it was weird. And didn't it's, you make? That's a... why I say it's so unpredictable. Like you just you never know what's gonna happen. Didn't you make a fair amount of money at like a one day little? Thing yeah, well, I made I made a lot of I made a lot of money for it being like a one day like five hours. Yeah, um, like it wasn't a huge take in terms of gross numbers, but in terms of like the well, it was you also in, free to go. Yeah, so it was basically it's really it's really small, so there's basically not really any room for more people. Mm. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in what I'm talking about, I don't know how how good it's going to be, but um, it's a f- vendors go for free. Um, there's maybe only like 20 vendors in there. It's really small. It's a one day thing. It only lasted about five hours and I made like $200 there. Yeah. That's awesome. Which I thought maybe I was going to make like $50. (laughs) Is that that one that you found online or did a friend tell you about that one? Ah, I think I found that one just by researching, um, conventions in Colorado, that, which is another way to find it. Like whatever state you're interested in going to a convention in, um, Go to Google because Google is your friend. <laughs> I've never found anything useful on Google. <laughs> and type in state conventions. So, mm-hmm. like, for me, I'll just go Colorado conventions, Colorado fan conventions, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And just because I – since we live in Colorado, I would like to try to get to as many conventions in the state as I can. Yeah. Because it's just easy. And it's it's the most efficient use of your time because you're not driving exactly. all over Kingdom exactly. Come. Exactly. Or flying or anything like oh, that. Or flying, yeah. Yeah, like the ones in Denver, I usually don't even, I don't even get lodging. I mm. just drive there each day, which next year at Nondesk Con, I might change that because they're... Are they moving? Moving? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to get a little like um, location specific here. So sorry, audience. But so you know that giant hotel that they're building outside the Denver airport? Yes. They're moving it there. Which is like 40 minutes outside of Denver. That seems like a bad idea. And it's, everyone's just like, why are they doing this? Yeah. It's so far away. Parking there is like $30 a day. I don't know if that's a good idea. So I don't know how that con's going to do next year. Yeah. Still going to try, but. Are they hoping people are going to fly into Denver specifically for it? I, I think it, I think the they're airport? moving there just because it's such a bigger space and they're going to have room for more stuff. Mm-hmm. But because it's so far away from town, I just. It's in the middle of nowhere, too. Yeah, I think they need to think about commute time because um, where do you go to eat? Yeah. I guess, like, you could There's pay for probably some stuff around food, there, but, but exactly. There's just nothing. Anyway, I won't get into that too much since, I don't know, the audience So probably, something you have to deal care. with as an artist is the people running the cons not necessarily making yeah. the best business decisions yeah. sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I th- yeah. I think I remember you having con. a con last year where they barely advertised it and, like, no one knew about it or something like that. That one probably was Malcon. Mm. which was probably my second worst con. Oh, I just name dropped. Oops. And actually, yeah, I feel bad for them because because of how bad they, the whole con did bad. I heard this this year actually at Fort Collins. I think I was talking to someone about it. Um, due to several factors, I think, that they didn't really think through very well, mm. um, the whole con just basically failed and they can't do it anymore. This is this oh, was their last year. Yeah. So that was pretty sad, but. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if you could spearhead this or not, but uh, at some point, like, it would be good for a resource to be created for con organizers, just like best practices, all that kind of stuff. Mm. I mean, we're, like, kind of creating one right now for Artist Alley people. Sort of. Sort of, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is going to be pretty helpful for people. Yeah, well, I don't know how many people out there are really looking into this, um, but... We're going to see. How many people would you have guessed want to start their own coffee shop? Because I thought that episode that was going like to That seems like it would be bomb. more... I feel like that would be more... I don't know. Because coffee shop is a bigger investment not. than being That's an true. artist at an artist alley. A much bigger investment. And I was like, this is just something I'm interested in. Um, you know, our friend Carly wanted to own right. a coffee shop. So I'm like, I'm just going to go do an episode for her. And uh, that episode has 100,000 views on YouTube. It's by far, by far the huh. most popular pop, uh, episode of this podcast that has ever been created. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. So, well, hopefully people find this one really helpful too. Yeah. I, I'm not saying like this is going to go viral or anything, but I think there's, <laughs> I know, there's I probably more that. people out there who will be interested than you might think. All right. Um, especially given like the huge amount of people who go to Comic-Cons. 
Because right. it's not just anime people who are right. wanting to get into this. It's yeah. comic as well. And I guess to do well at Comic Cons, you'd probably want to focus more on comic art, most likely. Yeah. I feel like when I go to Comic Cons, I see most people, like the really big artists are doing like Marvel DC characters, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Not necessarily always true, but like, because I went to Denver Comic Con this year and that was my best con that I've ever done. And I have like no comic book art. That's true. Yeah, you actually don't. I have a few buttons. I art? have buttons, but... You have Marvel buttons, right? But, like, I, I hardly sold any Marvel stuff. I, I didn't sell, like, any of those buttons, mm. really, at Denver Comic Con, which I thought was weird because I figured that's what they would sell. But at the same time, maybe all the people there already have their cool little superhero buttons and they didn't want mine, so... It's possible. Well, I guess if you're at Comic Con, then your anime stuff and your video game stuff is kind of, like, it doesn't have a whole lot of competition in terms of that fandom. Yeah. But if you're at well, Comic Con, then, like, and you have a Spider-Man print... Then there's yeah, there's insane like there's competition like competition for that. There's like 20 other artists with Spider-Man prints. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But so maybe that's part of the game. It's figure, figuring out like what's at the sweet spot of what the audience will want, but that there's yeah. not already a, you know a ton of. Right. It's that's why I say it's really unpredictable. It's just hard. It's it's so hard mm-hmm. to figure out what people are gonna want. Yeah. So it's, your spreadsheet. Ah. How to come back to the spreadsheet? Of course. What's the point of the spreadsheet? Um, well, so remember how I said I was really good at keeping track of things mentally? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> much impo- that's pretty impossible to do with the amount of cons that I'm interested in. Keeping okay. track of when all the um, application dates are, when like what states they're in, what like all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's like the one thing that I can't keep track of mentally because I actually counted, or I didn't count, but I looked at my spreadsheet recently and found out that I have over 160 conventions in my spreadsheet that I'm like even have slight interest in going to someday. Oh my gosh. Which is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. <laughs> Too many. There's no way I'm going to make it to all of those, mm-hmm. obviously. I, I don't think... Anyone does 160 conventions in a year. That's way too many. That's like one every other day. Almost. Yeah, no. Well, because like a lot of them will take like oh, and they're weekends, the same they're weekends, two, three days. Yeah, so, so I don't the, think you could do it. Yeah, no, you would have to be a massively successful artist and have like proxy sellers at like different cons. Like mm-hmm. you'd be at Anime NYC, but also you have a proxy seller at like Kimori Con or something. Yeah, because those are the same weekend. I'm not successful enough for that yet. <laughs> I can only think of like one that I would think might be. Which would, oh, does she have proxy Maybe. sellers? Okay. Oh, I'm sure she does. I was thinking of Archrovision. Oh. The people that make those 3D box yeah, I don't multi-layered know. things. I'm not sure. Yeah. I know they have a big website. Oh. But yeah, otherwise that would be insanity. Okay. But yes, so I have I have this massive spreadsheet to keep track of my ridiculous amount of cons. Mm-hmm. And I use Airtable. Okay. Um, at your suggestion, actually, because... An air table, I can switch. So I, I put all the, the dates of the convention into my spreadsheet. And it takes those dates and puts them into a calendar view. Yep. So I can switch to a calendar view and see, like, which cons are all happening kind of at the same time. Mm-hmm. And then I can prioritize which one, like, because I'll apply to multiple that will be on the same weekend. Yeah. Just to, you know, try and get as much of a chance as possible. But I can't go to all those. So basically, it's a good way for me to prioritize if I get into multiple, like which ones would I, which ones would I prefer to do? Mm-hmm. I haven't really had to deal with that yet, just because it's so hard to get into cons these days. There's so many artists that really want to do this, mm-hmm. especially anime cons are notoriously hard to get into. I've only gotten into two at this point. Yeah. Well, three now. Out of the AI lo- twice, probably not as con. Nandes Con is a lottery system, so... Oh, that... so it's literally just pure chance. Yeah. And then I got into that one in South Carolina. That's right. So that's three conventions out of, like, probably 20 or so that I've applied to this year. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult. <laughs> so it's kind of like being an author. Yeah, kind you of. Just, and every apply time you want to write a book, you, you just got to apply to as many publishers as yeah. you can and hope that one picks you. Yeah. So... The spreadsheet, I have the name of the con, the dates, um, what state and city it's in, when do applications open, because usually you have to apply for a convention at least six months in advance. Mm-hmm. Some some of them are more, some are less, um, but like six months in advance is pretty good to start like looking around yeah. when apps are going to open. 
Um, so I have the, yeah, the application dates. I'll have the link to the application page. Um, I'll have, I think I said attendance numbers already. Mm -hmm. Um, some of them I'll like send them an email asking for more information. So I'll have like whether I've sent them an email when they replied, um, Oh, how much the booth costs? Mm -hmm. um, how many badges come with the booth? Badges meaning like people who can get in? Yeah, badge meaning like basically your ticket into the con. That's right, okay. Yeah, it's called yeah badges. In and that's so world. your table helper can get in hopefully. Yeah, free, so right? like most cons will give you two badges with your table purchase. Some mm -hmm. will only give you one. Those kind of are annoying. But <laughs> It's a bummer. It's like you just have to pay extra to have my table helper yeah or just not have one mm -hmm. but um so yeah i have a massive spreadsheet with all the information each of those pieces of information for every single con that i even have slight interest in or mm -hmm. like that one sounds interesting um do you mark like priority at all i don't but i use the attendance numbers oh, okay in there cool. as my marking of priority so basically whichever one Basically, my priority is, is it an anime con and how much, like, how many attendees go to it? Gotcha. Um, yeah. So that's you how I You had an anime priority. con at 6,000 and a comic con at 20,000. Which would you go to? Anime con. He's, okay. So it's like, I would you, would need, go a, to the anime you con. would need a much bigger attendance number to prioritize a comic yes. con. Yes. And in fact, I just found out that next year, Anime Expo and Denver Comic Con are on the same weekend, which is super annoying. That is annoying. Um... And I'm going to apply for both. And if I happen to get into both, not guarantee that I'll even get into either one, I probably would choose Anime Expo over Denver Comic Con mm -hmm. just because Anime Expo is like 110,000 person Anime Con. So that's about the – would you say Denver Comic Con was 160? 115 about. Oh, so it's almost the same size. It's about the same size, but it's an Anime Con. Yeah. So it's kind of a no-brainer. So – the only thing is it's that it's going to cost way more to get there. I'm going to have to pay for lodging. Where's that one? AX is in Los Angeles. Oh, stay with my brother. Uh, fair. <laughs> fair enough. Maybe. We'll see. Um, that is a possibility. No guarantee I'm even getting going to get into Anime Expo, though. It's like that's where the most famous anime artists go. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'm worthy. That'll be you. <laughs> someday. <laughs> I would love to go to Anime Expo someday. But no guarantee I'll get into it. But maybe. It's also like that con's about twice the cost. Like the tables at Anime Expo are about twice as much as they are at Denver. I it's think they're about $500 for just the table alone. Plus probably $300 for a plane ticket, $300 for lodging. You probably wouldn't have to pay 300 to get to LA. Mm, bags. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Cause are you up to two check bags now or yeah, are you able to get I to basically, one now? I basically cannot do less than two ch um, checked bags at this point. Okay. Um, which is why I Wait, love Southwest. Southwest. <laughs> yeah, don't you get two free check you bags? You get free check, two free check bags at Southwest. So Southwest is the artist alley. Ha! Purpose, uh, Joke's on you guys. Artists, this uh, entire episode, episode was just <laughs> secretly an ad for, for Southwest, Southwest Airlines. Airlines. <laughs> just kidding. It's not. But Southwest is great because you get two free check bags. It's wonderful. I'll counter it. I don't fly Southwest. But that's because you can't get um, extended legroom seats, as far as I know. I don't need that. I'm short. But I'm yeah, I'm a tall boy, so when I can, I just I need get the, the two. Extended. I just need the two. I need the two check bags real bad. Yeah, for you, wish, it makes so much sense. I wish I could go down to one. I have no idea how I'd do that though. I would have to cut down on the stuff I sell a lot. Yep, it's probably worth it. Yeah, you probably make back the. Well, I mean, Southwest, Southwest also is also cheap, but yeah. If you were flying a different airline, it would be what? It probably would be 50 or it'd be 25 for your first check bag and then 75 for your second one. So, oh, it, so would, it'd be it would be 100. Total. Or wait, is it 75 round trip? Or is no, it? No, each way. Seven, oh, okay. So, so it's $200 total for check bags. Yeah. Yeah, fly Southwest. Well, yeah. <laughs> so. I haven't really had to experience that yet. Um, mm -hmm. The only one that I've flown to since I've had the two checked bags is Demicon, and that worked out fine. So gotcha. hopefully in the future, it'll continue to work out fine. The only really annoying thing is, is that even with the two checked bags, they're still both barely under 50 pounds a piece. Yep. They're so heavy. Ugh. I know, well, because you have to carry... You load it up sometimes. You have to carry all of your display equipment plus all of your merchandise. 
Yep. And in your case, you're carrying a eight pound button maker. Yep. So that takes that like help. almost a fifth of your suitcase weight yep. right there. Yep. It sucks. Anyway. Yeah. All right. I have one last question. Okay. How do you make con friends? Um, the easiest way is just to talk to the person that's next to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's how, at the very first convention I went to, that's how I made my friend Sean. He was right next to me. He's an author, super cool guy. Mm -hmm. Um, super nice. So we're friends now just because he was sitting next to me at my first con and we talked the whole time and now we're friends. And then even the person next to Sean, so it was me, then Sean, then, um, this other artist who goes by the Crayon Queen online. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe some people have heard of her. I don't know. But, um, yeah, she's one of my she's one of my good con friends now as well. Were you just, like, bending over your table and yelling at her? <laughs> well, I, no. <laughs> <Just> well, no. <laughs> I walked over and I, I told her, you know, it's my first con. Do you have mm -hmm. any advice? And so she gave me tons of really nice advice. Um, and she's the one who told me that the best way to find new cons is to talk to other people at cons. Hmm. And... Um, She's the one who has given me all the advice about how to store all of my prints behind the table, my keychains, all that kind of stuff. So she's been a super good friend. Cool. Yeah. And then, let's see. All my other con friends I made at Albuquerque Comic Con uh, back in January. Mm -hmm. And that was the first one I ever went to by myself. So I was kind of... Like, I, I call myself an introvert, and I am an introvert, but, like, I still, like, I'm, I think I'm more extroverted than a lot of other introverts are. But at that one, since I was there alone, I was kind of like, oh, this is kind of lame being here alone. I'm going to see, you know, if I can make friends with people. And there was a couple artists there that I already talked to a couple times before, like, the Crayon Queen was there. Mm -hmm. um, and her roommate was there as well, who I'd talked to. Actually, no, I didn't really talk to her until that one. And then, so um, an artist that I'm a really big fan of is named um, Crimson Chains Online. Um, and she was there. And um, so basically I would just go over and kind of talk to them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was Saturday. I was I went over and they were all of, all of them were like gathered together like chatting. They were like, oh, I think we're going to go to dinner. And I was like, oh man i'm not like part of their group yet it'd be so cool to go to dinner and then they looked at me and they're like hey you should come too and i was like <laughs> what uh yes i want to be friends with all you cool artist people so i remember the text so many <laughs> crying emojis <laughs> I, I have gone friends i know because <laughs> i was like i chatted with them and they were like hey you should come to dinner with us so i was like yes <laughs> I want to be friends with you guys. <laughs> so ever since then, um, they've kind of been turning into my con family. Mm -hmm. um, because they actually, they all live in Colorado now as well. So we all have like a little discord that we're in. And we're like chatting about other cons and like which cons we're going to be going to. And yeah, we'll share art with each other. And it's so it's really nice. I don't know. I feel like that was kind of lucky. I just kind of fell into that friendship. So, There's always lucky things, but yeah. I, I think you put yourself in a position for it. Mm -hmm. Well, it helps if you see uh, the same person at multiple different cons. So you, yeah. they start to kind of recognize you and then you're like, hey. Because mm -hmm. I remember you were talking to her at Comic Con. Yeah, cause the first yeah the first time I ever met Crimson Chains um, was at Denver Comic Con. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was like, oh, I admire your art so much. You know, we had both actually been in like a an online scene together. So I kind of connected her with that way. I was like, oh, we're both in this scene. And she was like, oh, that's so cool. Um, and then, yeah, by the next con, she was like, hey, I recognize you. And so we started talking more. Yeah. So basically, I don't know. Talk to people you admire. See them multiple times if you can. And then eventually maybe you will be friends. Organic friendships. Yeah. And probably very useful Discord servers. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that, the Discord server didn't happen until after Fort Collins Comic Con. Are there any, like, um, public artist Discord servers that you know of? Oh, I'm sure there's tons, but I don't really like joining public Discord servers. Okay. I prefer to have Discords with, like, people I know personally. Okay. So, um, unfortunately, I cannot provide any resources there, but I'm sure... 
if you went on to Tumblr or Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, you'd probably find some resources yeah. regarding that there. Yeah, I wish I wish I had something for that, but Well, you've already not provided a pu- quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, I'm not so. a public discorder. Mm-hmm. Not that. I guess I have the CIG Discord, but that's it. Yeah, I mean, I go in there. I'll go in there every once in a while. Um, so one thing I do want to mention is um, maybe people on the video version of this have noticed, but people on the audio haven't. But I've, I have a, a presentation, actually, about how to get started in Artist Alleys that I did as a panel mm-hmm. at Anime Iowa this past year. Um, and I do have, it's like a, it's basically a PowerPoint presentation. It's Google slides, but it's basically a PowerPoint. Yeah. And it's the PowerPoint presentation I used for the panel that I did all about how to get started in this kind of thing. If you're interested that, um, I have, I have it available publicly, so we'll put it in the show notes. Yes. So you can go through that. I have several friends who have been willing to provide photos of their displays um, as examples of like how to set up at an artist alley booth. And did I see you also have like a diagram about how to build it? Yeah. So I I have, I have, I did a few sketches of like different types of setups that you can have. Um, so this one I have, it's a picture of one of my displays and then I have little labeling arrows. Um, and then I have lots of links to detailed. Yeah. Did I not show you this? (laughs) I have not seen this before. Nope. Oh, all right. Well, um, so yeah, I have the names of like different types of displays that they're using. Just because one of the hardest things for me when I was starting out was trying to figure out what to even search in Google for the kind of display things yeah, what that I the, wanted to uh, use. What are the little wooden dowel things for your button packs? What was that? <laughs> was that like kitchen towel holders no, or napkin it, holders? It ended up being just wooden dish racks. That's it was a dish rack. That's what yeah, it was. Yeah, because I saw I saw a picture <laughs> on Google and I was like, what are those? Because they were they were because I was just looking up artist alley displays on like Google Images to get mm-hmm. like inspiration and i saw someone was using them for like postcards and i was like oh those would be perfect to display my button sets yep what are those though and i was like struggling (laughs) so hard i was like are they like postcard display holders i typed all these different things into google because i was like there's gotta be i don't these aren't i can tell they're not made for artist alley displays yeah they're not made for that but i don't know what they're made for so i don't know what to search and so i finally like i sent I sent it to you, and I think I sent it to Meg. And I was like, Meg, what are these? And she was like, oh, they look like dish racks. And I was like, <laughs> I would have never thought of that. <laughs> so that's one thing, too, is, like, if you can find stuff that's not really meant for artist alley displays, it mm-hmm. can still it can still work. Like, that, that ended up being the best way to display my button sets. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would have never thought to look for wooden dish racks yeah but yeah so this uh this presentation that i'm talking about also has tons of um links to places you can get prints made places you can like it has all the links to the uh the places that list conventions Mm -hmm. so like the anime cons fan cons.com things so Um, everything we didn't mention yeah, there's a ton. You just happen there's, to have it. Here. There's tons of stuff. That oh my gosh, you have didn't, everything in didn't here. Didn't have time okay. to talk about. Um, I need to update that. But um, there's a whole list of stuff you should bring with you to your first convention that you might forget. Um, tips about how to pack your suitcases, about how to um, transport everything. Um, just some general tips for while you're at the convention. Um, Let's see. Yeah, diagrams. Um, search terms to put into Google to find display equipment, that kind of thing. Where to get uh, business cards, stickers, basically everything that I could <laughs> think of that just because I've been on, I've been doing this only for about a year and a half, as we mentioned at the beginning. So I still remember all of the things that I struggled with at the beginning enough to be able to write them all down and be able to help people with them. Yeah. Um, that's the thing about like being an expert. You just, yeah. Cause I'm definitely not an expert. Well, that's with. why I'm like, I, when I get to the point where I do forget all that stuff, I, I it makes me feel bad cause I can't give advice anymore. So that's why I was like, okay, I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of becoming an expert. I think I, I'd, I'd say I'm like moderate right now, mm-hmm. but 
because of that, I still remember everything, but I'm like, okay, if I don't, if I don't do this now in another year, I might not be able to remember every, yeah. all the questions I had when I first started. So that's why I wanted to do this presentation. Yeah. I've only been able to do it once so far, but I'm hoping to, um, I'm hoping to do the presentation at more conventions in the future and do a more advanced presentation as well, mm -hmm. just because uh, there's so much, there's so much stuff. I could barely <laughs> fit this one into like an hour. So yeah, you have a lot of slides. Um, but yeah, so we'll li be linking this presentation in the show notes. Yes. Super helpful. I also, I can link the, I have, I had a little handout that I gave out as well at the convention. Okay. So you can link to that as well. Yeah. Know. Send whatever you have to, um, Guillerme and he'll make sure it's in there. Okay. And then we could probably embed this. I think there's like Google slides or. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Slides like embedding tools. Cool. I'm trying to think of what we should do the, for the thumbnail for this episode. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we could just, if you, if you're cool with it, we could just like put some of your art in the thumbnail and then have just oh, actually draw I would a little avatar for you. I would absolutely hate having my art. <laughs> hate having my art shown somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make sure to choose that uh, Axel and Roxas one where they're sharing ice cream. Yes. I'm not, I'm not going to choose that one. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Like... Okay. So you, anyway. you think we covered it pretty well? <laughs> what? You think we covered it pretty well? I mean, unless you have any more questions for me. Uh, I think that we covered it pretty well. and Hopefully um, I didn't ramble too much. I know I said I'm a lot, but... <laughs> Not used to we this. had a lot of really good information in here. Actually, yeah, I think we covered pretty much every single question that I wrote out here. Okay. Um, I would imagine there are going to be additional questions in the comments. So. Yeah, and um, I'm also willing to pretty much answer anything. Cool. If we get a ton of them, maybe we'll just do a follow up at some point. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I'm this letting this fun, podcast so. become whatever I want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is episode 274 which means you can go over to cigpodcast.com slash 274 to find the show notes. And I think for this particular episode, the show notes are going to be incredibly valuable because your presentation will be in it. Yes. Uh, and you should also just go follow my girlfriend on Instagram. What are you doing? <laughs> it's just, it's raining color, right? And fund my Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, fund your already funded Kickstarter. But you do have a stretch goal. I have a stretch goal I'm trying to get right now. Your stretch goal is actually the one that I wanted. So. I know. So yeah, well, high expectations. I might still make it anyway. It just won't be part of the Kickstarter. Yeah, that's we'll true. See. But, uh, but yeah, otherwise you can go over to cigpodcast.com without any slashes or numbers. If you want to uh, figure out how to subscribe to the podcast, we're on Spotify. We are on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pirecasts, whatever podcast app you have on your phone, we're probably on it. Unless you just made one up, you know? Uh, I could also put a boombox out in the forest and you can go listen to it that way. But I would recommend subscribing to the podcast. So you get new episodes and they come out every other Monday. We're on the bi-weekly schedule now. Sort it's of, much, not really. Sort but... of, kind of bi-weekly with some extra episodes thrown in here and there because why not? <laughs> Reasons, but. For, well, we've said it. We just had too many sponsors. Yeah. We, we couldn't double up sponsors and go completely bi-weekly. So I think we have like a couple of extra episodes until the year is done. And then we will evaluate what we're going to do for 2020. Oh my gosh. 2020. Yikes. I'm so old. Time keeps on <laughs> slipping, slipping, slipping. Anyway, collegeinfogeek.com is where you can go to find all kinds of awesome articles. In fact, uh, you know, I was going to do a narration for an article that we just had come out on the show today, but I thought this would be a better idea. But the article that I was going to do is a huge guide that Ransom wrote about how to move to a new city. Uh, so if you are thinking about relocating for a job or for school or for whatever, that article is fantastic. It goes over how to pick your city, how to budget, how to figure out the cost of living versus your hometown, uh, how to make friends very quickly. Awesome guide. So go ahead and check that out. You can, all, as always, find our resource pages, uh, college packing list. I guess back to school is kind of over. So... Everyone's who, back to who school Who needs now. the college packing list? I don't know. We also have our list of essential books and lots of other cool stuff. And if you want to support this show, a great way to do it is number one, share it with a friend. Or number two, go over to Apple Podcasts slash iTunes. Give us a five-star rating and review. Of course, if you think this is a five-star podcast. I think it's a five-star podcast because you're on this episode. <laughs> Just kidding. When Martin and I are on it, I don't know. It's like three and a half stars at best. Aw. <laughs> I'm sure you guys are great. It's, it's pretty good. I guess it's pretty good. Anyway, great. thanks for listening. Bye.
Oh wait, stay cute. 